so far in this entire chapter, Jesus has taught about prayer, has taught about Satan, and being an example of Christ's light in the, in, the, in the world. This week, he will cover the fourth and final topic here, the danger of hypocrisy. So before we get into God's word, let's ask him to speak to us this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you brought us all here together, Lord, um, to worship you in song. And now we ask that you receive our worship in our, as we study, as we get into your word, Lord. Speak to us this morning. Um, fill this place with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Soften our minds, our hearts to receive um, what we're about to read, Lord, Lord your word. Um, may we have just a, a real personal encounter with, with you right now, Lord. We want to hear from you, Lord. We want to grow deeper in, in, in the knowledge of you, Lord. So speak to us, Lord, right now, and, and we just glorify you at this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 11, verse 37. And the word of God says, As he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw this, he was amazed that he didn't first perform the ritual washing before dinner. But the Lord said to him, Now, you Pharisee, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and evil. Fools! Didn't he who made the outside make the inside too? But give from what is within to the poor, and then everything is clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, you give a tenth of mint, rue, and every kind of herb, and you bypass justice and love for God. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, you love the front seat of the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you. You are like unmarked graves. The people who walk over them don't know it. I'm going to stop there and break down a little bit of what we just read. Now, having just discussed about how a person can be in the light and what they must do to remain in it, Luke records an instance of someone who was in the darkness. A Pharisee had invited Jesus over to his house to dine with him. Uh, by this time, the, in the Lord's ministry, the majority of the religious leaders had put a target on his back and were looking for ways to destroy him, to discredit him. Well, our Savior was well aware of this. He knew that they hated him, yet he still accepted that Pharisee's invitation. Now, why is that? Well, for a couple reasons. Because one, it was against his divine nature to return the hatred. And two, he saw every encounter as an opportunity, as an excellent opportunity to teach powerful truths. The Pharisee, however, had a different agenda. To find something, anything that he could point to to criticize his guest with. And it didn't take long. The moment Jesus reclined at the table, the Pharisees' jaw, jaw dropped when the Lord didn't perform the ritual washing before dinner. Now, this washing was more of a Jewish tradition than it was a command in the Mosaic Law. Regarding these ceremonial washings, theologian and Bible commenta commentator uh, William Barclay described how, how special stone of vessels of water were kept because ordinary water might be ceremonial, ceremonially unclean. And performing the ceremonial washing, one started with at least enough of this water to fill one and a half eggshells. One began by pouring the water over the hands, starting at the fingers and running down towards the wrist. Then each palm was cleansed by rubbing the fist of the other hand into it. Water was poured over the hands again, this time from the wrist towards the fingers. 
Now a really strict Jew would not only do this before the meal, but also between each course through the meal. The rabbis were deadly serious about this, saying that bread eaten with unwashed hands was no better than excrement. A rabbi who once failed to do this was considered excommunicated. Another rabbi was imprisoned by the Romans and used his, his ration for water for ceremonial cleansing instead of drinking, nearly dying of thirst, but being regarded as a great hero. But he was being regarded as a great hero. hero. So as you can see, the religious Jews, to the religious Jews, the, the washing of one's hands didn't really have anything to do with being hygienically clean. Rather, it was all about maintaining the tradition of the ceremony and having that outward appearance of being more pious than everyone else. Now, had these religious leaders been, concern, been more concerned about cleansing their hearts than they were about their hands, they would, have even, they would have even been more godly men. Well, at this point here, Jesus pretty much stopped being polite and begot, began to call out their hypocrisy. Now, using some objects that may have been right in front of them there at the, at the dinner table, he first pointed out the failure, the failure of his host and his companions. They were more concerned that the outside of the cup and dish were clean while completely disregarding their internal impurities. He then uses that cup and dish to show them the cause of their failure. Inside, you are full of greed and evil. They seem to have forgotten that the same God who created the outside also created the inside and that it needed to be cleansed as, as well. He finally pointed to the cure of, for, of the cure for their failure. Give from what is within to the poor. In other words, they needed to cultivate the inner virtues, love, generosity, humility. Only these would render them truly clean before God. Then, in verse 42, Jesus launched into a series of woes, expressing grief over the Pharisees' actions and attitudes, and predicting calamity for them if they didn't change. The first woe, the first woe was, pronounced, was pronounced against selective obedience and the neglect of the commands of true piety. He pointed out that they, were, that they were careful about tithing, even the tiny leaves and seeds from the herbs, but they forgot about the important things like justice and love for God. Now keep in mind that Jesus wasn't saying here that they should stop tithing, but that they should put their religious activities into proper perspective. As Christians, we mustn't assume that all people, that people will know we follow God if we just look like one and play the part of being one. Not only is this another form of religious legalism, it's also religious hypocrisy. A historical figure gives us a good example of this. He made the free use of Christian vocabulary. He talked about the blessing of the Almighty and the Christian confessions, which would become pillars of the new government. He assumed the earnestness of man and weight uh, of a man weighed down by historic responsibility. He handed out pious stories to the press, especially to, to the church papers. He showed his tattered Bible and declared that he drew strength from, the, from his great work from it, uh, do great, do, I'm sorry, drew the strength of his great work from it as scores of pious people welcomed him as a man sent from God. Indeed, 
Adolf Hitler was a master of outward religiosity with no inward reality. Brothers and sisters, the proof of our Christian faith will be known by reflecting the love of God on a daily basis and doing what we can to ensure justice and hope for those whom society tends to oppress and ignore. God said in Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9, make fair decisions, show faithful love and compassion to one another. And in Micah 6, 8, it says this, mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to, hum and to walk humbly with your God. The second woe in verse 43 had to do with the Pharisees' pride, with the Pharisees' pride of being the center of attention during public worship. Rather than making sure the people were focused, were focusing their attention on God, they were purposely putting the spotlight on themselves. Thus, Jesus here was pointing out that they were more in love with themselves rather than being in love with God. Augustine once said, it is not the being, it is not the being seen of men that is wrong, but doing these things for the purpose of being seen of men. The problem with the hypocrite is his motivation. He doesn't he does not want to be holy. He only wants to seem to be holy. He is more concerned with his reputation for righteousness than about actually becoming righteous. The approbation of men matters more to him than the approval of God. Sadly, the church today is filled with leaders who are more focused on building a name for themselves than they are building up those they lead. If you aspire to be a leader in the church, your goal should never be to make yourself the center of attention. Your goal should be to help others grow and mature in their relationship with God for the glory of God. This is what Peter told the church leaders in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, care for the flock that God has entrusted you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. The third woe is found, the third woe in verse 44 has to do with deceptive and, the deceptive and, and deadly false teaching. There, the Lord compared them to unmarked graves. Under the law of Moses, specifically in Numbers 19, verse 16, whoever touched a grave was unclean for seven days, even if he didn't know at the time that it was a grave. So by saying this, Jesus was letting the Pharisees know that outwardly they gave the appearance of being devout religious leaders. But in reality, they should have worn a sign warning people that they'd be unclean if they came into contact with them. Like unmarked graves, they were full of corruption and uncleanness. And Although their teachings seemed genuine and true, they were actually infecting others with their externalism and pride. Well, apparently there was someone else nearby hearing what Jesus was saying and was also feeling the sting of his words. So let's read about how that interaction went by Picking up in verse 45. Luke chapter 11, verse 45. One of the extras of the law answered him, Teacher, 
when you say these things, you insult us too. Then he said, woe also to you, experts of the law. You load people with burdens that are hard to carry, and yet you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, you build tombs for the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Therefore you are witnesses that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their monuments. Because of this, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, so that this generation may be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible. Woe to you experts of the law. You have taken away the key to knowledge. You didn't go in yourselves and you hindered those who were trying to go in. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to oppose him fiercely and to cross-examine him about many things. They were lying in wait for him to trap him in something he said. Have you ever inserted yourself into a conversation between two people because you didn't like what you were hearing. It was bothering you. What they were saying, you were just like, uh, no, I, I need to get myself into this conversation. It was an A and B conversation and you see your way in. Well, I know that I have many times I've done that. I made the mistake of doing that. And I've learned that regardless of how much I want to, it's probably best that I just stay out of it. And I'm sure this was a lesson, this expert of the law, or in the law, or scribe, learned after this incident. This particular expert of the law felt the sting of our Lord's words and tried to defend himself and his fellow scribes. Jesus, however, responded to his complaint by leveling additional woes on the scribes using three vivid illustrations. Burdens, tombs, and keys. Just like the Pharisees, the religious lawyers were guilty of studying the law and writing modern interpretations that the people were obliged to fulfill. By doing this, they were loading people with burdens that were hard to carry. Then, when, those, when they couldn't fulfill those obligations, they looked down on them scornfully and condemned them for not fulfilling the entire law. Meanwhile, these legal experts never lifted a finger to help the people. They never showed the people how to keep the law. They never tried to make obedience easy. They just kept heaping more regulations on the people with, a renew with renewed condemnation. Thus, they too neither showed love nor justice. The second illustration the Lord uses against the experts of the law were tombs in verses 47 and 48. Jewish leaders, especially the teachers of the law, with their expertise in scripture, erected elaborate monuments and built tombs for the prophets to honor them. The Lord Jesus, however, knew better and saw right through their actions. You see, while outwardly disassociating themselves from their Jewish ancestors who killed the prophets, they were actually following in their footsteps. Like their fathers, the religious leaders of that current generation were also refusing to obey the teachings of their Old Testament prophets. And they were also refusing to obey the prophets that, that, that were there. They, re, they didn't want to listen to John the Baptist, and they certainly weren't listening to Jesus. Not only that, but they were, also, they were building their monuments while they were building their monuments, they were plotting the death 
of God's greatest prophet, the Lord himself. See, in other words, Jesus was telling them that they weren't really honoring and celebrating the prophets. They weren't honoring, honoring who they were and what they taught. They were, in all reality, honoring and celebrating their fathers for rejecting the prophet's message and killing them. Jesus then prophesied that these leaders would complete the rejection of the prophets their fathers began by persecuting his disciples. In demonstrating wisdom, the Lord promised that God would send Christian prophets and apostles that would teach them that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, how would that generation act? Just like their fathers, Jesus declared, they will kill and persecute God's messengers. Having celebrated the ancestral prophetic murders and participating in killing Christian prophets and apostles, this generation will take the credit. They will all be held responsible for killing all the prophets since the foundation of the world. Everyone in the Bible, beginning with Abel in Genesis chapter 4, the Bible's first book, clear through the killing of Zechariah in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 21, the Hebrews' last book, they all will be held responsible, he repeats. What then will be the verdict for that generation? Guilty of murder in the case of every prophet of God. Now, can you imagine what God's sentence must be? In his final illustration, God used the image of a key to rebuke the religious lawyers. In verse 52, Jesus accuses, accuses them of having taken away the key to knowledge, that is, robbing the common people of the knowledge of the Word of God. Now, as experts of the law, they were supposed to have more knowledge than anyone else, particularly knowledge of God and His salvation. But because they had reinterpreted, overinterpreted, and misinterpreted the law, the key to that knowledge was no longer in use. As a result, not only were they preventing themselves from entering the kingdom of God, but they were also hindering others from trying to go in. It would be kind of like, or as if you had the key to your house. If you had it in your pocket, but we're looking for another way to get into the house. You're locked out. You're looking for another way to get in to get you and your family inside during or in the middle of a snowstorm. Who do you think would be held responsible if they froze to death? If you just kept looking for a way to, another way to get inside the house and you had that key in your pocket the entire time? Who do you think would be held responsible? if they died in that snowstorm. Well, here's the point. These so-called experts were practicing their profession in such a way that they accomplished exactly the opposite of what God intended for them. Now, because of their stubbornness, others were paying the consequences it was bad enough that they wouldn't be entering the kingdom themselves, but it was far worse that they were hindering others from going in. Well, after Jesus had left the scribes and Pharisees from, uh, had left, the, left the, the dinner, the scribes and Pharisees were seething with anger by the Lord's straightforward accusations. So Luke tells us in verse 53 that they began to oppose him fiercely 
and to cross-examine him about many things. Their intent was to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested, condemned, and eventually be put to death. But in doing so, it only proved everything that Jesus had said about them. It only proved that everything he said about them was true. Hypocrites don't like to be called out on their sins because it hurts their reputation. So when you do call them out, if you do call them out, don't be surprised if such people respond to correction and truth and the truth of God with outrage and accusations against you. Gaslighting. That's what they're good at. Hypocrites are good at gaslighting. Now, we just saw how Jesus used burdens and tombs and keys to illustrate how the experts of the law were harming people who wanted to draw near to God. I want to take a moment to show you how we as believers can use those same terms to help people have a relationship with God. First of all, unlike the scribes who were loading people with burdens that were hard to carry, as Christians we can help people know that God can remove them. The Bible says in Psalm 55, 22, Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We live in a world where people are worried and anxious about many things. They're anxious about what's going to happen in November during the elections. What's going to happen during the, the, the primaries and what's going to happen during you know, the conventions. And they're worried about who's going to be the next president. They're worried about social media. They're worried about how many followers they have or how many likes they have. They're worried about, you know, if they're going to get that next car, or if they're going to, you know, there's just so many things they, they get anxious about and worried about. Now, although these things are minor, they're not really big deals, not as big as being worried about how you're going to get your next meal, or, you know, how you're going to feed um, your family, or, or how you're going to find that next job. We can help them by letting them know that they, that they cannot place too much, of, too much weight, that they can't place too much weight on God's shoulders. Not one of their worries is too heavy for God, for the God who has already traveled the depths of their misery, carried our curse on his back, and then thrown off the chains of death to every worry want or weakness, no matter how big, he says, I will supply every need of yours according to my riches in glory in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Secondly, unlike the scribes who honored the tombs of the Old Testament prophets, but following in the steps of those that kill them, we can help others by telling them that we have a king a priest, a prophet, a, and a savior who isn't in the tomb. In Acts 2.24, it says, God raised them up, ending the pains of, that, of death, because it wasn't possible for him to be held by death. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, Paul writes, but, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
this means that they don't have to go to a tomb to honor Jesus Christ because he isn't there. He can be honored every day and every moment. Why? Because he's alive. He's not in the tomb. He's alive and he's right now and he's right now he's sitting at the right hand of God. By confessing, trusting, believing and obeying him, we're given a promise that we will also live even though our bodies may die. How is that? Well, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. And thirdly, we can help others by using the key of God's word to lead them into a relationship with Christ. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Those who have insight will shine like, bright, like the bright expanse of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Church, brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is the key to the scriptures. When you take away that key, you cannot understand what God has written. As helpful and necessary as theological studies are, the most important requirements for the Bible study, for a Bible study are a yielded heart and an obedient will. Warren Risby said this, some of the best Bible teachers I have known in my own ministry were men and women who learned the truth of God's word on their knees and on the battlefield of life. They were spirit taught, not man taught. As we just read, Jesus wasn't shy about pointing out the hypocrisy of the religious leaders, even in their own homes. He was dining with hypocrites. What, what an amazing Savior we have. What an amazing Lord. Even though the, He knew they hated Him, even though they knew, He knew that they were out to get Him, He still said yes to the invitation. He still went to His home. Now here's the thing, he can see right through us too. He can see right through you and he will call you out as well. Therefore, you can't pretend to be pi pious while neglecting justice and love for God. We shouldn't pretend, we shouldn't love ourselves more than we love God. We must be genuine in our outward and inward devotion to God and avoid being infected with externalism and pride. We're warned not to load people with the burdens of rules and regulations that are too heavy for them to carry. And we mustn't withhold from people the key of knowledge we've been given in God's word so that they may enter the kingdom of God. Luke 11 indicates that church people should, be, should beware for Jesus has more problems with religious people who do not repent than with sinners who do. Our passage this week should challenge you to ask, where is your dedication? Is it in love, is it in the love of God and justice for all people or in fulfilling your religious rules, and gaining glory for yourself on earth. Where is your dedication? Where is your heart? Is it just like these Pharisees who pretend to be one thing on the outside, but inside they are corrupt, they're evil? 
they haven't really yielded to God. They haven't really given themselves up to the Holy Spirit. They haven't surrendered themselves to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure many of you probably have. But you're, yet you're still holding on to pieces. You don't want to let go of them because... For some reason, it brings you comfort. Well, Jesus wants to free you from that burden. He wants, to let, he wants you to let it go. He wants to do a radical work in your heart. And he wants to show you that he alone can do it. He alone has the power to do it. Nothing else will. Give it to Him. Surrender it to Him. And watch. And just watch and see how your life completely changes. How it completely... How it just turns... How your life just completely gets turned around. He cares for you. He loves you. He wants what's best for you. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. We all know that. But even in those difficulties, He's there. Even in those hard times, He's there. And we can cast those worries, those anxieties, all that pain upon Him, and He'll take it. And we just have to cling to Him. We have to hold on to Him, and, and He will. He will comfort you. He will give you that spirit of, His spirit of, of, of love and mercy and, and and he will embrace you with his everlasting arms. So let me say again, watch out for that hypocrisy. Be careful. It's very easy for someone to, to turn into one. And don't be surprised if one day Jesus calls you out on that hypocrisy let's pray Lord Heavenly Father we, we come before you now and ask that you check our hearts oh Lord that you see where we're at that you see exactly what's going on in there and that you will point out to us those hidden places that we haven't released to you yet. Lord, it's for many of us, for many people watching this, it may be scary to let go of those things because it's those things that they've always held on to that always brought security and comfort. But show them now, Lord, that they can give it up to you. That they can give those things over to you and that it's going to be okay. That you will supply all the comfort, all the love, all the love that they need. Lord, we're so thankful for who you are and what you've done on the cross. That you've forgiven us of our sins and that we're now your children. So remind us every single day, Lord, that you are our Father, that you are, you do love us and you do care for us. And you do want what's best for us. If there's anyone watching or listening and, and you're at the end of your rope, you're tired of finding comfort, finding peace, finding meaning in other things. And you've hit rock bottom. All those barrels are empty. I pray that you, if that's you, I, I want you to, to, to open up your heart to Jesus. 
Let him in and watch him radically transform your life. Watch him fill your heart with his spirit and transform your life. If that's you and, and you're ready to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you want to be born again, wherever you're at, Go, you can get on your knees or sit or stand or but with all your heart with all sincerity pray this Lord God I admit that I'm a sinner forgive me of my sins I believe you sent Jesus Christ your son to die on the cross for my sins and I confess him now as my Lord and Savior. I cast my burdens, my sins, my anxieties now upon him, upon the cross. And as I'm being emptied of that Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill all of my heart. thank you for doing that. I thank you for sending your son to die for me. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you. Praise you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.